Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Genomics Bootcamp. Today, we will continue to discuss the final reports. These are the rather large text files that come back from the genotyping laboratory, and their structure is not always well known. So we will look at what they contain and why they are so important and frankly also quite interesting. Okay, so this is how the final report looks like. So this is just a big text file, basically with one line for each SNP and each individual. But before we get into the further details, I have an important note to highlight. And rather unconventionally, I cut back to myself also just to give you a piece of advice, because too many times I have seen how the people deal with uh, the final reports. Frankly, sometimes happens that the people are just all too happy to get back pad and map files from the genotyping company, which is okay for the short term, but doing so they are frankly locking themselves out from future possibilities. So if you are ever in a position that you are ordering genotyping or you're doing genotyping yourself, just make sure that you have the final reports as well and you save them. Because frankly, the storage space is cheap nowadays. And frankly, you can get out much more from the final reports as you uh, might imagine. I will highlight some of these advantages of having the final report in this video. So just, uh, well, stay tuned for the other parts, I guess. Okay, so back with the actual final report. So I put this one uh, also online so you can download this exact file via the download link below. As you see, this is a comma delimited file and has basically two parts of the first one is the so-called header and the second part is the data. Well, just a short notes on the header. So this basically contains information about the genotyping itself. This file has been anonymized by me. So basically the two things I changed was the date of genotyping and the IDs of the animals. So I change it from the actual IDs to Bostaurus 1 to Bostaurus 10, because they, well, they are 10 animals and these are really data from cattle HD SNP chip. Also to fit into the data re requirements, these are just SNPs from the very beginning of the first chromosome, but it fits very well to our purpose to basically talk about the final reports and also in a later stage to transform this final report to a blink, pet and map files. You, so you see that the bulk of the data consists of uh, comma delimited columns. As I said, one line stands for one SNP for one individual. In order to clarify a bit more and to see it a bit better, I loaded this main part into R, so we will discuss it there. But basically the columns are exactly the same as, as it is shown in this file. So this is the bulk of the data loaded into R. First, I would note that there are actually spaces in the column name. So there is in the file is this snip space name, but in, in R it's replaced by a dot. So if you need to account for this in any way in your scripts, then yeah, just I'm just making you aware of this. Then uh, what we have in the final report are basically all the information that are known about the individuals and the genotypes. And these might be familiar to you also from the other files that we were discussing before uh, on this channel. So when it comes to a SNP data, we have here the SNP name, the chromosome and the position. And when it comes to the family information or the animal information, we have the animal ID. Yeah, basically that, that's it. All the other information as for sex or also some parent information and other, other things like that need to be filled in from an other source. But basically what you have here is the connection between the animals and SNPs. And here comes already the first piece of advice or information why are final reports much better than single pad and map files when it comes to long-term usefulness of the data. Now in the pad and map files, usually what we have is, well, basically two alleles per each SNP. So for example, we have allele one forward and allele two forward in our pad and map files for Plink. 
which is perfectly okay for us if we are doing any type of analysis, you know, PCA or anything like that, or even any more uh, sophisticated analysis. But what happens if uh, we have a colleague or a collaboration or something, and they have the data, for example, only in a top format? You see that the SNPs here are not uh, perfectly the same. So basically what you need is, if you want to merge the data, you need to have them in the, the same format as we also discussed this one in the video in data merging. So long story short, by having the final report, you have the flexibility to extract whatever data you need, whatever format of the SNPs you need from your data, and you have a much more possibilities of collaboration, data merging, and all these kinds of things. So you are much more flexible having the final reports. You can have it either have your alias extracted or you can have your SNPs extracted in a forward format, in a top format, or the AB format as well. Then here are some other interesting information that come from the Genome Studio that has to do something with the SNP quality itself. In some publications, you might see a alternative for the quality control, so not the way that we did it before, that we are basically checking for the missingness in the SNPs, but another method that, that checks for the so-called GT score and the GC score. So what are these GC and GT scores? So these are basically a quality metric for a SNP. I believe they range from zero to one, one being the highest, and the low gene train scores are basically meaning uh, faulty SNPs similar like this. So basically when the, these clusters are or ovals are too close to each other, so the SNP is quite useless. So it gets a low gene train score. And there are some other SNPs which are quite good and uh, well, they are well separated. So they get a high gene train score or GT score. So with this GT score, you can apply additional selection pressure for the SNPs. This choice can be done even from the SNP chips. So if you are not satisfied with the conditions and the quality cutoffs that are on the SNP chips and you have, one, and you need just the highest of the high quality SNPs, then you can do so by cutting at a certain GT score threshold. And while the GT score was the quality metric of the SNP, the GC score or a gen cal score is the quality metric of the, well, also the SNP, but related to the individual call. So the SNPs that are in a center of uh, these ovals that are very high quality, and we are very sure about these SNPs, high on GC score or GINCAL score, and the others which are very low, then they these have a low GC score. But again, this could be used as an additional quality metric because what we see here, this dark shaded area is actually a limitation on the GC score, I believe around 0 0.15. But what happens if you are want to push uh, quality limits higher than this? For example, this goal, this animal or individual was called, but apparently with a lower GC score because it's further from the center of this oval. So in fact, what you could do is define a higher GC threshold than the 0 0.15 that is on the chip by default in which this individual would not make it to your observations because it's not a super high quality uh, SNP call. Also, here are some other metrics. For example, the cluster sep is also, the cluster separation is also uh, something similar to the GT score, I believe. But also there are some other, these metrics, the theta R, X and Y, which are actually the metrics that are being used to create those graphs that we were seeing before. And the third thing I want to show you in this video are two other metrics that are also included in the full final report. And this is the so-called BIU frequency and the log R ratio. Now, these are two very interesting uh, statistics that allow you to analyze copy number variations from the SNP data. So the copy number variations would be, for example, deletions that are usually detectable only from the whole genome sequence data. But with these two metrics, you can actually do and detect, for example, larger deletions also from the SNP data. 
If you're interested in this, I would direct your attention to a paper in GSE. You see it in the bottom of the screen. So this paper is from our former PhD student, Wilson Nandolo, and he was doing research exactly on this topic. And there is a very helpful figure one already in the paper that shows how you can detect actually deletions, single or double, or a dupli duplication, or a run of homozygosity based on a log R ratio and a B allele frequency. And so how this compares to a normal situation when we have uh, two copies. So you see that just by plotting these two numbers throughout the genome, you can find out pretty interesting things about your population. So before the final words on the final report in this video, I would just remind you about the possibility to subscribe to the channel and uh, if you find this video interesting, then be sure to send it to your colleagues. As for the follow-up, of course, what we can do and will do on this channel to transform these final reports to Plink, what we will do in the next video is create LGen, FAM, and MAP files and read them in with the L file Plink option. So the more adventurous of you, you can already go ahead and try to do it yourself or just wait for the next week where I will show you how it is done and also give you the scripts for it. As for today, I thank you for your time. Thank you for watching this video and have a nice rest of the day.